You never know if it could change your life. Take a chance, you need a wrong or right. Good morning, Matt. And welcome Good morning, to Rob. Did you get your another pump on? E- I did get my pump on. I have I am I am here. I am pumped. Did, and did folks, you feel we are ready so- to pump you up with information. Did you feel the, the blood rushing to your, your arms? You could feel the skin tighten. <laughs> I did. I did. It's like, oh, I'm sorry. You got to cut this, but yeah. I, I had to do the Arnold. Uh, it's it's like, like coming all the time. It's like I'm coming like, in the gym. It's like I'm coming in the gym. <laughs> I'm coming at home. It's great. I'm in it's front great. of I'm in front of 5,000 people, and I feel like I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. That man was governor of the ninth uh, largest governor economy. of the state, and, and quite frankly, by all accounts, not a terrible one. <laughs> that, that's how low the bar is for for governorship. Anyway, hello. The show is something. I We've think it's forgotten. called Dungeon Master, if none. I'm Dungeon Master Matt. And I'm Dungeon Master Rob, and we've got a, a full docket for you today. There's been some some pretty interesting news, which we're going to discuss, and then I think Matt has a special surprise prepared I have a surprise for, me, for you. Which I love. I love surprises. <laughs> I, I love surprises. I love surprises. Anyway, um, we're going to see what that's like. It, Rob Rob doesn't know what's coming. He can't take an action. Uh, he is disadvantaged <laughs> that's right. on that's right. Uh, I, um, dexterity I'm, saving I'm, throws. I'm at the at the end of the initiative order. Uh, but first, let's talk about some announcements. So uh, on our last regular episode, Matt, and we get no credit for this, and nobody has to uh, to give us. But uh, let it be known that Matt predicted the name, or at least the the uh, in universe author of the upcoming book which is Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, uh, which correct. is presumably our next Volo's Guide, Morden, Conan, Morden Kanan's oh. Tome, filled with it's character It's going to be, I think, a more, more of a Xanathar's, if we're being technical here, right? Because it's more player stuff, like 30 oh, subclasses. you're correct. No monsters. That's right. Yeah, at least one new subclass for each of the 13 uh, 22 new subclasses, five reprinted, not including artificer subclasses. There's some... and you're going to get your armor. Your armor will be an official subclass. Finally, official. Finally, we like to see it. Some alternate class features, things to maybe boost up the ranger. Um, I, I think the big one, the big one is going to be a new system, which. God, we've been talking about this for like two years on the podcast for mm. uh, races or species and stat and trait selections. We really don't know what that's going to look like, but it will allow supposedly players to pick their stat boosts and maybe separate cultural from like species traits. Yeah, it, it's a, a lineage system, which... If we understand what Wizards has said so far, so it's it's it decouples ability scores from from your actual race or species. We'll we'll see what it actually looks like when it comes out. They're also removing negative ability scores from those that that ha- or negative racial modifiers from so those like that have them. So like an orc, uh, kobold, or a kobold, which yeah. I think are the only ones, and those are both from Volos. So that'll be interesting. Um. And I uh, assume this is this is official. This is canon again to the extent that it matters. But uh, yeah, I think that's that's um, this is now official play. You're you know you don't have to ask permission from your DM. Well, you do, but you know you don't have to like <laughs> negotiate it's like a, a little easier. Or anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then we talked about these before. This is cool. They're um, they're printing some new spells, including all those cool new conjuration spells that we talked about. In right. the um, the UA a few weeks ago, a few months ago, I don't remember when that was, but I like those. This is cool. So I think it adds. L- 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 <laughs> go, go ahead. Here's one thing I didn't notice when we talked about those new conjuration spells, the ones that are summon instead of conjure, unless they've changed it. Summon phase spirit should let you summon, uh, like actual uh, pixies, which <laughs> have the ability, I think, to basically cast very high level spells so uh that that could be um yeah a fun niche I, abuse uh, case. I i i definitely feel like there's some potential for abuse here but you know yeah, players would would never would never do that uh they're also this is interesting i don't know what this means but 
somebody or one of the articles about this said that there were feats to open up multi-classing. I'm not sure what uh, what exactly that's going to mean, but I'm interested to see. I'm what... I'm sure it's going to be a feat that gives you uh, like a partial class feature. Like, yeah, you get monks unarmed strike or something like or that. Or rogue sneak attack or something like that. Yeah. At a, like a lower progression level. That makes sense. That would be cool. Um, Just because be cool. multi-classing is so punishing. There's also some new magic items, which have been prompted, uh, boosted pretty. They seem pretty proud of this. Uh, let me say this. I'll believe it when I see it. Uh, they, they said that they're trying to make magic items more interesting. We will see. Um, we will this see. Is a, this is a promise that, that Wizards has made since the beginning of 5th edition. We will see if they can accomplish it. But, um, yeah, looks it's, pretty cool. Yeah, it, it does look pretty cool. The character they've chosen for this one is Tasha or Natasha, a.k.a. Igwilv, which is a Gygaxian name. Have you heard of Igwilv before? I've been studying my Greyhawk with Andy. I have not so heard I know a Igwilv. Bit about... Igwilv is before my time. I, Igwilv. After my, I don't know. Didn't have, never heard of an Igwilv. Evil wizard witch um, from Greyhawk. She is one of the, like, older villains from the Greyhawk setting. And uh, she is most known for being, like, the enemy of the main group of wizards in Greyhawk, the Circle of Eight. And she's also the mother of Ayuz. Remember Ayuz, the, the demigod king of the evil kingdom of Ayuz? Anyway. Extremely generally, Deep yes. I, I, I remember that sort of kind of, yes. Deep Greyhawk lore, apparently she has a pseudonym named Tasha, a.k.a. Tasha's Hideous Laughter, which is probably where most of your players will know her from. Uh, that is where I know her from, but Matt has done the deep research. Yeah. Igwilv is a, is a much better name, I think, even though it's Gygaxian stupid. I like it. I wish we had Igwilv's I just like, cauldron I don't know. of everything. I, Igwilv's Hideous Laughter, though, doesn't, like, flow... Uh, quite as well as Tasha's or Tasha's Irresistible Dance. Wait, is it? It's also Tasha's Irresistible Dance, right? I, Those are both her I spells. I think so. I think so. And and now, OK, I don't want to offend any Tasha's that we have it, <laughs> who are listening. But to me, like Tasha is like the er fantasy name, like for uh, like a a <laughs> Uh, female gender like character like oh what am I gonna call it I gotta come up with a cool name that's a little relatable but also fantasy sounding it's gonna be Tasha right I feel like I've read a bunch of bad fantasy novels where there's a Tasha character Igwilf it's weird Ig Ig Igwilf is weird there are also some things that were in Eberron that we liked are now going to make it to I think just general play. I mean the, uh, the artificer class, the artificer, but also the, is be the group patrons, which mm. uh, were a, were a cool idea from uh, Ebron. Again, not something that you necessarily need written up to do, but it's like your or your party is serving, uh, you know, a dragon or an adventuring academy, more grave or, university, right? Right, uh, which is a cool idea and a you know a, a useful thing. Also, sidekicks. I don't know if you remember these. Yeah, I remember um, we talked about the UA sidekick on the show. I guess they were re they did end up in the essentials kit, which. Um, yes, I never I never looked at that. Um, I looked at it and I remember that. Now, one of the interesting the things me. is apparently they said in one interview that uh, the sidekicks could potentially be there for players to use as a character class. I'm interested to see how that will work, because uh, that was definitely not something that was in the UA. So broadly, Tasha's initially I was like, ah, look at all these fucking reprints. What do I give a shit about that? But on on further reflections, there's some definitely some things to look forward to that I'm interested to to see how they implement uh, some some kind of some cool new things. Ultimately, there's nothing. I'm not sure we're going to see anything 100 percent new which is always a disappointment and also kind of par for the course with wizards these days but the yeah. the implementation is always kind of interesting somehow and, and sometimes they make interesting changes at the last minute here's 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 what i'm going to base my judgment on probably when it comes out which is the one thing that is i think 100 percent new is this lineage system which we never really got in a ua and if it works it'll be great if it doesn't work uh, it'll be a huge disappointment. I mean, 
it would be hard to fuck this up because about a thousand people have come up yeah. with really good homebrew a- attribute systems. Like it's actually not it's actually not super hard to do. That right. being said, if anybody can fuck it up, it's probably wizards. Yeah. So what? A billion different third party creators have tried this and you can find them all on the DMs Guild or even just by Googling alternate, you know, racial system or something like yeah. that. Yeah. And and other other D and D adjacent games have this. It it is not actually like all that difficult to do. It is the the game is balanced very well. It is hard just based on ability scores to break anything. You know, it it'll it's a small difference, but without without the like one point five modifiers and other modifiers of previous editions. Like if your orc has eighteen strength and your human buddy has sixteen, it, it's not actually gonna you know shatter the game mechanics but you know we'll see we'll see what happens Uh, it um i am i am interested to see how this uh this pans out i don't think wizards has ever added enough stuff in any one book and the books release slowly that it ever feels like bloat which is uh i don't know kind of a made-up word that RPG commentators talk about a lot are there too many extra rules is the system becoming too encumbered we should probably someday just do a whole episode on the Tome of Battle, which is yeah. sort of the 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 um, the primary document for you know the death of three point five and the the hatred hatred of rules bloat and the Marshall versus Caster dynamic. But you know that was one. And book, I actually and I, really like the Tome of Battle. I love so maybe, the Tome of Battle. Maybe I, I really don't think <laughs> that it broke people. the game, but no. like I don't know it. it um. It was fun. It let marshals do cool things and not like all that. Anyway, what we should do a whole whole episode on it just for fun so that people know the the history. But I think Wizards is very, very gun shy about putting out anything that radical or chunky. And so nothing, yeah, nothing they've put out has been all that dramatic, though, so, you know, <laughs> they're not shy about breaking things like Samurai and Arcane Archer still don't really work all that well and that was like they broke them between the ua and the actual book which was you could yeah. release a errata or something but no there's nah, nah that's fine on, whatever why, just, why deal just, just deal with it just deal with it just uh no one play these classes that everyone wants to play it's fine uh one cool thing i'm I, one cool thing that would be i guess question mark new uh is a um a reprint or a rework of the blade singer uh, which mm. was one of the very 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 early subclasses in right. Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide. So I'm curious to see what that looks like. Maybe they'll reprint those tasty martial hybrid cantrips, Green Flame yeah, Blade. Yeah, and... some of those are good. They're good. I like some of them. They're good, especially if you want to play a mix em up spell sword character. Anyway, so that's one thing I'm keeping my eye on. But yeah, so we, we know a lot about Tasha's, but there's still a lot to be seen. November no... 17th, 2020. November 17th, so so. Uh, keep your we'll be here your, with keep a your review third of it. eye peeled. Yes. Uh, keep your arcane eye uh, arcane on eye. the mm-hmm. yeah. We'll be here to talk about it regardless, so you know what to think, right? That's right. Please don't form an opinion until we tell you whether it's good or not. Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. That's what we're here for. The other piece of news that is mm-hmm. worth discussing. Is uh, and we've talked about this quite a bit, so I'm not sure there's like a whole lot of news. Now there's to not say. too much to stay, but, but I, this but is wanna... a surprise announcement, though. Uh, yeah, so Magic: The Gathering will not be having a standard um, uh, in card 22 set. set in 2021. 20, um, 22. What? Uh, Magic sets, Rob. They're like new cars, right? If you want to buy this year's newest Toyota Corolla, you buy the 2021 Toyota Corolla. Is it really called the 2022 set? Yes, there's M21 out right now. Okay, sorry. Uh, sorry, everyone. Um, cancel me <laughs> for not being a good nerd. Right anyway. now, you could get the core set of 2021, and next year, you would assume you could get the core set of 2022, but instead... But instead, they are going to be printing some sort of... Dungeons and Dragons themed. Uh, it, it, this, this it's called not a lot Adventures of... in the Forgotten Realms. So there's not That's a lot of basically all we know about it. Yeah, here, but yeah, there will be some kind of D and D Magic the Gathering crossover. I'm guessing that it will be just a 
that maybe that Toril will be a plane. You'll have your Drizzits and your Elminsters. Ooh, Matt, Matt. Oh, no, I don't want to do this. Yeah, go ahead. What <laughs> if, what if they retcon it and the Elminster is a planeswalker? Oh, I'm sure he's a planeswalker. Well, I mean, he's a chosen of Mistra. He is. Which basically gives him all the power to have all the powers, which is always a cool thing to have. Right. Um, he's the protagonist, hmm. not you. He is. We know he's planeswalked before to Ed Greenwood's kitchen in Canada, like <laughs> British Columbia, Canada. Right. I, and, he did that you know, in several. What What's interesting is that uh, Toril is already part of a uh, a. Uh, multiverse plane, a multiverse of planes so listen you do he's, not he's... planes walk between the planes you get in your spell jammer you exit the crystal <laughs> sphere you take the philostum stream to the next crystal sphere that's how you travel between planes and the material plane so you know we've already talked about how the uh the how arrows I... in a different direction now how, though, right how, how how do i want to put this as as Generously as possible, the uh, yeah, the sure. Hasbroification of wizards, you know, means that from a certain perspective, uh, because Dungeons and Dragons, despite being a uh, a storied and ancient and honorable franchise, <laughs> okay, um, just whatever. Yes, <laughs> bear with me. Uh, is subordinate to Magic the Gathering because Magic the Gathering makes a bajillion more dollars than than D and D does. So while it may irk me uh, somewhat that you know Toril, I don't know exactly like how this is going to work canon canonically, and everyone can just choose to ignore anything that they want. But it yeah. seems like it may be that suddenly uh, everything that's ever happened in Dungeons and Dragons is now just a part of the greater MTG storyline, which is. We discussed this at length in a previous episode. Super fucking bonkers and uh, sometimes not that good. Um, sometimes actually quite bad. So I I guess like I want to see how this is implemented. Maybe it'll just be a bunch of cards printed with like cool art, which is good. But also it might mean like an increasing uh, synchronization of the two franchises, which I have already expressed my. I don't hate it, but I don't love it. It's it's not what i what i would like i guess so this is yeah would yeah i mean to to draw a little on clifford geertz here and the <laughs> ideas of low and high culture to That's me right. it seems like the inevitable cycle of popular myths you have something like uh, the Watchmen comics, which are a critique on superheroes. And then you fast forward 30 years and you have a movie adaptation that's a straightforward presentation of them as superheroes. You have Dungeons and Dragons and then it spawns a renewed interest in like high fantasy. You have a bunch of people who play Dungeons and Dragons, write the first Wizards cards and then uh, for, for Magic the Gathering. And then 30 years later, uh, there's a set for actual Magic the Gathering. Well, this is this is a this is a great let's let's draw Matt upon these metaphorical notes for a Balinese cockfight <laughs> and talk about talk about what what would a um, what would the Watchmen it's deep of play deep play Rob. <laughs> it is deep play it is, it is deep play Matt that's what Dungeons and Dragons is I'm the, imagining Rob, I'm Rob, imagining the, the, the I'm nerds. imagining a, like a like a like a you know. Uh, Clifford Geertz like coming and sitting in on my my D and D sessions and right. like writing up this like deep, uh, you know, analytical discussion of like how it informs our society, right? Uh, and and we'll you didn't really earn the trust of of the paladin and the bard until like you all had to run away and hide from the cops and this is actually right. like okay, we're gonna tell you about we we now. bonded by all being like uh, have you know getting swirlies in. <laughs> In middle school for doing Dungeons and Dragons, that's what that's what like b binds our society together. Right, um, it's a bunch of fifteen-year-olds and one uh, very white anthropologist. That's right, who's in getting, his forties and, and his wife and his wife. His wife. His wife. What would a what would the Watchmen of Dungeons and Dragons look like? Like what would what would it, like what if someone were going to like try to do a high art of D and D? Like what, I mean, what would what would that low, be? The low art of it, I think for kids was adventure time mm. adventure time i think for children was like a let's take ideas of D 
D&D and fantasy and turn them into a kid's show. I've only seen a couple episodes, but I was like, oh, that's what this is. I don't know it's about really good, though. if Adventure High Time is probably better. Happened. Like, it's probably more valuable to society than most of, like, existing D&D lore. I'm just... <laughs> sure. <laughs> I think you're not yeah. wrong that it's, that's technically low art. However, yeah. it is... It has more value in general. Anyway, but, like, high art... Um, high art, what would, it would be like... Let's there's see. There's been one novel that is one, uh, like, high art praise that delves deep into what D&D might mean. It's that Juno Diaz one, right? It's the Juno Diaz. uh, He's canceled now, but uh, his book remains. His his book is good. Uh, Death of the Author, everyone. You can still read it. Yeah. But, I mean, it's more about being a nerd and not not about D&D itself. It's definitely that nerd experience of I'm into D&D, but I never got to play it that much. I guess like like a Watchmen of D&D would be one that merges a very, like, realistic and, like, real and important in universe story with a you know out of or out of game drama something that like makes them somehow both meaningful and real but you know binds them together and takes itself very seriously and right. uh, is dark I mean, and I, gritty a couple weeks ago i watched a online performance of wins she kills monsters and while that was a play for the theater i don't think it was uh high art like it was a fun little enjoyable play right well and this has been tried before it just hasn't been done very well and yeah. frankly i find it incredibly it was very boring good, i i don't particularly care for this type of storytelling but uh anyway i i'm still waiting for somebody to try to reclaim dungeons and dragons for high art uh damon lindelof uh <laughs> Hit, hit me up. I'm 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 here to uh, to to give you my ideas on how to how to take a beloved nerd franchise and ruin it for everybody. Rob always still trying to write the great Trillion novel. <laughs> All right, Matt. Go I'm back and for get your, your MFA, Rob. Okay. Never. All right. Never. Let's take a quick break. Let's let's. <laughs> and and I'm gonna quiz Rob. Uh, that's your surprise, Rob. Uh, I'm so okay. excited. So, Rob, you and I know that, and and I think we need to put this disclaimer here, and maybe we will even prove it during this segment, that (laughs) knowing trivia about D&D, is it worth anything? It, knowing trivia about most things isn't worth anything. Yes. It is a it is a fun hobby. It can be good for for your own storytelling or for your own gaming, but it but it has no uh, inherent value. Uh, the, your ability to recall facts, I'm sorry, Matt and I are both historians. We're very good at recalling facts. I want to let you know it has absolutely no value. There there is there is nothing useful about by itself having a lot of like factual like specific knowledge being able to remember remember names and dates and whatever B- by itself without the connective tissue of analytical and critical thinking is useless so w- as somebody who has a ton of useless trivia let us let me and matt be very clear and say <laughs> that it does not matter for shit with that being said uh rob uh welcome to uh play the little drop sorry i want to from- i want to embarrass matt and i real yeah. fast uh, by by talking about <laughs> Uh, when we were we were young young boys uh, and very into Star Wars, uh, we got into re- <laughs> repeated arguments with um, a friend of my father's and uh, his father's uh, who was who was older, and uh, about Star Wars trivia. And so Matt and I would try to like get him on stuff from the extended universe, and he would say, "Yeah, but that's not canonical. It's not and- canonical. <laughs> we, we this is if you want to know what made Rob and I into like." You know, this is our, we were bitten by a radioactive XY. We were bitten by a radioactive cannon nerd yeah, at like yeah, age he, uh, 13. He owned us when we were, we were too young to fight back and we, we've never right. recovered from this. <laughs> and we've been struggling to learn the difference between like George Lucas cannon, A cannon, B cannon, you know, ever Disney since. cannon. Yeah. yeah. All right, Matt, quiz me. So we're, we're going we're gonna to find out <laughs> All right, how uh, good What's the name of the twins who were spies for the Empire in the cantina? <laughs> oh, they don't have a name because it's not a cannon. All right. <laughs> Remember they were smoking the little thing? That's right. That's right. They do have names in the later, I think, Tales from Jabba's Palace. Yeah. But if you read that and thought that mattered, well, you're a fucking idiot. Yeah. 
I, I love, and that is something I do love about the original, like, Star Wars, like, Cantina and Jabba the Hutt palace scenes, is every one of those dumb Muppets and people with makeup on <laughs> eventually got their own five-part novel. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's it's great. very good. It's very good. All right. R.I.P. Hammerhead. When when are we going to get another Hammerhead? Yeah. Were there even any Ithorians in the in uh, the, the, the sequel trilogy? I don't think so. Where, where's yeah. my Ithorian well, representation, folks? Yeah, it's actually conversations like this one, Rob, that made the sequels <laughs> suck so, so hard. That we we <laughs> personally are the reason why the, yes. the sequel trilogy was bad. Uh, it's just wanted a good movie. I think we got maybe half of one good movie out of the three. Maybe I'm in generous. the middle I'm one. I'm going to say 1.25 to okay. one and a half good movies all taken together. Um, I bet I, I bet if, I bet if you cut big chunks of the first and last one. Nah, the last no, okay. two. If you cut, if you the cut big chunks of the last two, and a lot of the first one, and really like aggressively stitch them together, I bet you have like a good movie there. Yeah. Don't don't get mad at us. Sorry, friends. Okay, anyway, Rob. Here's your first, first question. So, uh, play the Who Wants to Be a Millionaire drop, and here's your first question. Uh, okay, Rob. If you have a creature between yourself and a target of a ranged attack or a ranged spell attack, what modifier do you add to the attack roll? What does the target have? The target has plus two to their armor class because yeah. they have cover. All right, we're going to have to get much tougher here. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, <laughs> yes, good. <laughs> I forget about cover all the time. Yeah, right? by the way, I also want to be clear, just because I know this rule does not mean that I remember to implement it. Um. It is actually one of the rules that I either intentionally leave out or I just forget about the most often. I find myself forgetting about cover a lot because we often don't use maps at my tables mm -hmm. these days. And also, yeah, it's fine. Also, it's my players always forget. Thing. And I, like, I feel bad if someone's like, I'm going to shoot at this person. I'm like, yeah, but they've got cover. It, it just, you know, it especially if they're super excited to make their attack. I don't know. I it. it it's, a, it's, it's a, you got to feel it, you know, fifth, fifth edition <laughs> We're doesn't have it's a lot better than it used to be, but it definitely still has these these corner case or easily forgettable rules that uh, can real, really bite you in the ass. All right. Your next question is from the history category okay. in uh, in the original D&D &D red box. Mm -hmm. How many classes were there? OK, OK. All right, I, I want to own how bad I'm going to be at this. So I, I'm going to I'm going to say I think that there were fighter, uh -huh. rogue, wizard, and I know that ranger was a later addition. I want to say paladin. So four is that is that right? Oh God, you're 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 really off. Uh, that's uh, you're back down to zero points, Rob. Oh no. Okay, how bad was it? Okay, so the original classes were man at arms, aka oh, fighter. Oh fuck me! God right? damn it! Uh, I'm thinking of uh, not the. I'm thinking of like first edition. Yeah. Yeah. Magic user. Cleric. Ah, cleric. I'm the fucking cleric. And you missed four entire classes. I just remember. Uh, you don't I remember have that my bow, my axe, or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, to give you a hint, what they're not classes anymore, and haven't I been don't, for a long. I don't time. know what they are. You, you have to tell me. Uh, yeah, I, I don't elf. know anything about the red box. Oh, that's right. That's right. Because they were uh, dwarf, racial classes. Racial right? classes. Elf, yeah. dwarf, uh, halfling, uh, halfling. Yeah, that's right. I'm sorry. I I was thinking of a uh, of first edition. Yeah, sorry. My early D and D knowledge is pretty limited. So if Matt put a lot of these in here, I'm gonna oh, fuck it up. Not not only early D and D. You'll be okay. But that's okay. Okay. Let's yeah, early D and D was very different. We've come okay. a long way. Okay. All right. So uh, I'm, all right. I'm uh, one see. for one, which is a good a start as I could expect. Uh, this is an easy one. These are all I thought softballs uh, at the beginning, but maybe maybe not. Um, who <laughs> is the creator of the orcs? Like in universe? In universe? In I guess let's say uh, the Forgotten Realms. Is it Grumsh? It is Grumsh, the yes. one-eyed. The one-eyed. There you go. All right, you're all right, back okay. on the board with 200 points. Um, all right, all right. I don't okay. think I've ever done anything 
uh, interesting with Grumsh in I, any so of my I once, campaigns. Actually, I think this was a game that you ran. But I once played a Rage Prophet, which was oh, a yes, the rage which was prophet. a prestige class from three point yes. five, where you needed levels in Barbarian and Oracle, uh, and you were a kind of like a raging like spirit summoner. Uh, but you you had to you had to follow. I think you were encouraged to follow Grumsh, like they were mostly like orc. Uh, which was a really cool idea in my head, but in practice was an absolute garbage class. Anyway, so that that is that is and I think like a lot of them put their eyes out anyway. So that's that's how I that's how that's all I remember about Grumsh. That's my that's basically my lore interaction with the the creator of the orcs. OK, uh, we're back to rules questions, Rob. OK, OK. Um, a monster is immune to damage from non-magical bludgeoning weapons. The monster falls 100 feet. Does the monster take damage from falling? Uh, you, can, you, can use did, a, I, you can use a lifeline on this, Rob. No, I'm going to say wanna, lifeline. If you want to call a friend. No, I don't want to call a friend. Um, I didn't even know there was a rule for this. I'm going to go ahead and just tell you how I would rule as yeah. a dungeon master, which is that, yes, they do take damage from falling however i can see that perhaps rules as written that might not be the case what is what is the what do the official rules say rules Matt? as written yes they would take damage your okay. instincts and the rules actually line up in this case because falling right. is not a weapon attack falling ah uh, it's not a weapon attack okay that's what I, that's kind of what i thought but i was okay cool all right otherwise i'm glad that, I'm glad that <laughs> makes sense because that would be that would also be something that i would not be surprised was the other way around but right. uh yeah if it was the other way around i would definitely like have an evil villain that has a bunch of monsters who are immune <laughs> to bludgeoning damage in his or her service and you know like drops them like paratroopers on the <laughs> city like out of this flying castle well, or something like, like that you know <laughs> physically like what what hurts you i mean you know just be, just like if your skin is immune to like bludgeoning like you still like it still rattles around your insides, like yeah. like like Luke Cage couldn't like jump out of an airplane and not die, even though like his skin would be intact, like his insides would be liquefied, right? I don't like, that's know. Just, yeah, that's just like he, how physics works. He could do it if it if it looked cool, I guess. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know why I'm trying to apply yeah. physics to physics to comic to books. Luke Cage. All right, uh, let's see. We're back to uh, a a history question. Okay. Basic question. Dungeons and Dragons came out in what year? Fuck if I know. Uh, hang on, I'm going to guess. Let, let's see if you can get close. I'll give it to you if you can get within uh, two years. 1978. Ooh, that's no cigar for Rob. Uh, 1974. Well, what? Yeah. I'm so bad at this. <laughs> I really <laughs> no, I, the, like, everything. Everything prior to like second edition just sort of like runs together in my mind. I, I don't know a goddamn thing. Um. Well, yeah, that's fine. I'll, that, I'll that's it. OK. What we want to demonstrate here is how little this shit matters. I also want to <laughs> let everybody know I have a pretty dim opinion of early versions of Dungeons and Dragons. Sorry to you big Gygax heads out there. Um, it was garbage. It sucked. I wouldn't play it. Just letting you know. Sorry. OK, let's do another uh, lore question that Rob Rob will hate. I uh, can't wait for this. OK. In the Forgotten Realms, the ranger, Drizzt Doerden, has an animal <laughs> companion, a black panther. What is that animal companion's name? Oh, fuck me. Uh, I, <laughs> I I have read at least one Drizzt book. And see, this is the bad thing. I have never read a Drizzt book. So, so I should know. You should know. <sighs> His animal companion's name, I... I'm never going to remember it. Does, uh, does he it's, talk it's, to his animal companion? In I the don't book? remember. He, he's got it. He like, doesn't he like summon it from an onyx figurine? I don't I don't fucking remember. What, what is it? I'm going to be mad when you tell it to me. But what is it? It's I, and I know I, I can probably barely say this. It's Gwyn Hever. Yeah, OK, I wasn't going to spell all Welsh like Welsh like Gwyn Hever. Yep. 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 Yep, uh, that's Panther. Hey, maybe we'll see some Drizzt uh, as we're visiting his home in Icewind Dale next week. 
we were talking about it, but one one cool thing, not Drizzt specifically, but we might get some good art from the MTG cards. That would be cool. Though, if they really wanted to make us mad, they just reprint art from existing D&D books or D&D uh, properties, which is what they might do. That's exactly kind of lazy shit that Wizards would do. Prove me wrong, Wizards. Prove me wrong. Yep. Okay, uh, here's another rules question, Rob. Can you attack or use the attack action from prone? In 5th edition, sorry. Clarify. Rules questions are all 5th edition. Uh, you can at disadvantage. Ooh, nicely done, Rob. Rob, you, you give yourself not enough credit for knowing the intricacies of the rules. <laughs> I Again, unfortunately not that you need to know. I unfortunately know the rules a lot better than I need to, but yes, I, I guess I do know the rules. Okay, yeah. Uh, that's right, right? Yep, yes, you can, but right. at disadvantage. That yeah. is absolutely exactly the correct uh, answer. All right, uh, here's another sort of history question, Rob. A boat on the River Oceanus leaves... <laughs> Arborea at 10 a.m. <laughs> it arrives <laughs> it arrives at Elysium at 2 p.m. What plane did you travel through? Arborea to Elysium. You traveled through the elemental plane of water? Ooh, you're on the great. You're not on the great wheel. You got off that wheel, Rob. Oh, I got so, off the wheel. Uh, here, I'll, oh, I'll oh, give oh, you a oh, hint. It's, Arborea it's called, um, is chaotic good. Right. And right. Elysium is, is neutral good. This is neutral good. So what's the halfway between those? Wait, is Elysium lawful good? Elysium's neutral good. Mount Celestia is lawful good. Well, then I don't know what you would go through going from chaotic good to neutral good. Uh, there's one for all the like nine corners. There's one halfway plane. And the answer oh. in this one is the beast lands. Oh, fuck the me. I was going to get that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, which also, I think in some early publications was known as the happy hunting grounds in an example of real bad racism, uh, <laughs> I think. Uh, but yeah, the beast lands. <laughs> Yeah, there was no way I was going to get that. Yeah. OK, interesting. I have heard of the Beastlands. I did not know that they were a half plane or a halfway and I didn't know where they were located. So we're all learning something today. We're, we're all learning something. Uh, the Great Wheel is is full of fun, fun things. <laughs> OK, uh, Rob. All right. Here's a lightning round for you. I'm going to put right, I'm ready. 60 seconds on the clock. OK, you have 60 seconds to name the spell effects. <laughs> Of the ten eye stocks of a beholder. Ah, okay. Go. Uh, one is disintegrate. One is paralyze. One is petrify. One is straight up death ray. How see? Paralyze, petrify, um, paralyze, petrify, disintegrate. Mm -hmm. uh, instant death. Um, Got that. One does fire damage. What is that? Is that five? Um, Thirty. Thirty seconds. Uh, you've got you've got four. One is a ray of frost. One is a um, one is imprisonment, I think, or it used to be. Is that even a spell anymore in fifth edition? Uh, don't 15 stop. Fifteen seconds. And let's see. Frost. Um, let's see. Uh, confuse. Ten seconds. Confuse is the last one. That's what I'm going to go with. Confuse. OK, uh, you, you've you got. Uh, let's see. I've got I've got. Nine guesses from you? Maybe I missed one. That sounds right. And, yeah, I got okay. <laughs> time, time is I was, up. All right. I was counting on my hands, but, you know. You were, I was sure you are going to get this, Rob, because you were on a roll in the first 10 seconds. You got uh, correctly right. I just uh, remember, the, the thing is, I remember all the ones I've died to, but I. Um... <laughs> <laughs> you missed. You, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you right now, you got four points. OK, that's four right. out I, of can, ten. I can live with that. So that's a failing grade, but that's that's OK. There's this pass fail course. You can bring it up. Um, just write the what, professor. What, what are they? Wait, what are the other ones? then? OK, so the ones you got correctly are death ray, disintegration ray, uh, petrification ray, uh, and I believe sleep ray. Uh, okay. The I didn't say slippery. I'm going to go, I'm gonna okay. go ahead and like Never own mind. that I didn't say that. Uh, I said okay. paralyze. Uh, paralyze. So even worse. Paralyze was correct. Paralyze oh, okay. was correct. Okay. So you got those four right. Uh, the ones that are not on there that you said were confusion, imprisonment, frost, and No, I said confuse. I said confuse. I said imprisonment. Yeah. Neither of those are on there. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay. okay. So, so are here, are, here are the correct rays. Charm ray. Uh, Charm person. Paralyzing ray. 
I said parallels. Eight. You got that one right. I'm, I'm going Sorry. through them all. Sorry. Oh, fear, okay. Sorry. Ray. <laughs> fear, oh, ray. Fear, fear. Slowing ray. Innervation yeah, ray. Telekinetic ray. Sleep ray. Petrification ray. Disintegration ray. Death ray. So you got oh, all the man. big hitters. Oh, man. You I missed about some innervation. of the little ones. Forgot about slow. Okay. Charm. Yeah. Charm. Okay. Well, yeah. Like I said. Bonus I'm question. Going... What does the main eye do? I'm sure you know this. Uh, the main eye has true seeing, right? Or uh, Ooh. Ooh. Oh, no. sees through illusions. Oh, no. no? Oh, no, Rob. It's a anti-magic field. Oh, fuck. That's right. Whatever. Again, I hate not beholders. important. <laughs> you can look at the stats. <laughs> I hate beholders. I, I kind of do, too, though. I, I love, and we'll save this maybe for our Spelljammer episode. Beholders have giant organic ships in Spelljammer and that also have eye stocks, which is super cool. I mean, cool. they're mostly just like a really well-designed monster that is incredibly difficult and unfun to fight and has a ton of like random like effects. So like unless your party like vastly over prepares, they're going to fuck somebody up and uh, it's not always a good time. It's definitely a monster you want to deploy if your party's like itching for a challenge and then you can give them the time to prepare. Like I like it when a party's like we know there's a beholder there. We know it's super deadly. We're up for this challenge. We want to yeah. kill it because it's got something we want. Yeah. Right. Or it's it's fucking our shit up and we're ready. Yeah. All right. Rob, according to the fifth edition rules. Right. And this is, uh, I think, kind of a uh, niche case, but it's important uh, because we've been talking about it. Can you cast spells underwater? You can cast spells underwater if you are able to, I guess, meet the somatic and verbal verbal components. So, I don't know. I guess the answer is yes, but, which probably isn't correct. It de- depends on whether or not you are able to speak and or move underwater. I'm, I'm going to give you that one because okay. this is unclear in the rules. And... Like so many things with D and D, like in order to have the answer to these things, instead of them, you know, being compiled in a nice handy FAQ or you know thing, uh, you have to go find a tweet by fucking Jeremy Co- Crawford. Oh, this is um, one of those ones where he's clarified in a tweet, and you got to dig right. it up to find the answer. Yeah, not a fan of these. Not a fan. So being underwater does not prevent spell casting, and the ruling seems to be. Yes, there's there's no real conditional. I mean, I would say maybe you have to be able to breathe or some way operate underwater if you want to use a verbal component. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, logically, if you can't speak, you yeah. can't cast a verbal spell, so you would have to have water breathing. But otherwise, I can't think of any reason why you wouldn't right. be able to cast. There's no, like, the spells don't come with any above water, below water, you know, Component, so right. That's that's so, interesting. So there's two answers from Jeremy Crawford here. One says yes, you can cast spells underwater, and another answering a question uh, four years ago: if a creature can breathe underwater, can it perform the verbal component for spells underwater? And Jeremy Crawford helpfully says yes. <laughs> okay. So that's all clarified. Uh, we're all, all right. We're all good and ready there. All on the same page here. Okay. <laughs> okay, I think it's time for another uh, fun uh, history question here. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, uh, so, uh, Rob, in order, and I know how much you love the Forgotten Realms. This is, this is I'm gonna, I'm already gonna fuck this can, up, I can't wait. Can you name the gods or goddesses of magic in order from creation to the current timeline? Oh, um, I actually had a subplot about this in one of my my games that I actually Ooh. ran. So, oh, God, though, I can't remember the name of the first one who was. Let's see. There was one God and they all have like same sounding names. <laughs> you're on the right track. I'm, I'm was, telling you right now, you're on the right track. And this is something I would never fucking remember. I, I can't remember. It was very close to Mistra, but it wasn't Mistra. There was that one. And then he or she died and passed their mantle on to the, the second Mistra, who during the time of troubles was killed and passed on her mantle to a mage named Midnight, who then became the new Mistra. 
which is who then also disappeared during the spell plague and died, but didn't actually die and is now back as still Mistra, I think. I'm probably missing a god of magic in there somewhere, but like that's what I remember of this particular this is like maybe the only part of Forgotten Realms that I've ever paid any attention oh, yeah. to. And as you can tell, <laughs> I still don't know it that well. So fucking understand it. Neither do I. I think all of those answers are correct, other than uh before Mistra there was a Mistrill. God but you basically damn, got right. that being mistrill. like, oh, there's one that's uh, different. Who thought name. that was a good fucking idea? Mistrill. I, I just mistrill. like I knew it was so close, but I couldn't remember. Yeah, I, I was interested in this because I, I think there's actually one piece of Forgotten Realms lore that I think is kind of interesting. I like this is a bit like I think it, it kind of tickles me when they explain um, rules or universe retcons within universe stuff. So I'm always interested in the time of troubles and the spell plague and all this stuff. And so Mistra is by some accounts, you know, the most powerful God because she controls the weave. And so, you know, there's some interesting stuff happening with her and the gods in general, but uh, still, still kind of doesn't make any sense. Still kind of like really incomprehensible, but yeah. This one is not as hard as it sounds. Okay, we'll see. Rob, I need the rules explanation or, you know, basically explain what it is. How do you calculate Thaco? T-H-A-C-0. It's the it's the role that you need it to hit armor class zero. Two, that's what it stands for, to hit armor class zero. So the lower the number, the better your Thaco is. Right? That is, that, is, that, that is correct. Okay. Um, right. Uh, if a player character has a Thacko of 10, right, um, and they roll a 12, right, that means they can hit what? And they can hit an armor class negative two, right? Yes. Yeah. You got it. You understand Thacko. It's not that hard. It's not uh, that however, hard. We're, we're glad it's gone because it, it's it, still it is kind not of confusing. Actually, that complicated. However, it is so counterintuitive that it's just so hard to explain yeah. that uh, it. It, 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 there's no reason to do it that way. That's just uh, that's, that's our one of opinion. Those... You can disagree with us, but yeah, it is too I, complicated. Not, not a lot of Thaco defenders still running around, are there? Like that's that's a <laughs> that's an old like war game legacy thing. Which again, it works fine in a war game, but like yeah, just make it easy for people. You know, yeah. All right, Rob. Maybe previewing our uh, episode, another lore question on on a spell jammer. Of okay. all of the D and D races, which one has conquered the most crystal spheres in Spelljammer? Oh, interesting question. I don't know the answer. Is it well, the Illithids? Is it the Illithids? Close, but too evil. The answer is the Elves. According the elves. to the Spelljammer oh. box set, the Elvish Imperial Armada has basically conquered the most Spelljammer crystal spheres. Fucking space elves. Fucking space elves, man. Never, never would have thought. Okay, yeah. interesting. Me neither. Until I was rereading that. We gotta do a Spelljammer episode. We're, we're gonna do it. I, I think, put a pen in it for next week. Let's do a Spelljammer episode. I've been meaning to do this forever. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, interesting. Elves. Okay. Okay. Last 5th edition rules question, Rob, and... Uh, uh, I think it's a. I think it's an easy one. I guess we'll find out. Your muscle wizard <laughs> is wielding a shield. Uh huh. He or she or they also casts mage armor. How do you calculate their armor class? Uh, let's see. Mage armor. Mage armor gives them a. Is this a trick question? Because they can't cast mage armor with a shield. It is, might be. Is, you you got to consider all the possibilities, Rob. Because I think they can. Uh, let's see. Shield is. Let's see, I'm actually about to show my ass after getting all these rules questions, right? Uh, shield is plus one armor class? Plus two? Mage armor raises their armor class to 12? I don't know. Uh, I think their AC would be in the absence of uh, leaving aside dexterity base of 13. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So what's your final answer? My final answer is it's uh, I, you their AC is 13. You calculate it by adding base of 12 to whatever the armor class of the shield is. That is basically correct. The okay. correct answer is 13 plus two for the shield plus, of course, dexterity. Dexterity. Okay. 
Uh, okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. It's, I didn't it's like that. Tough. I didn't like I, that at all. <laughs> I don't Sorry. like... I, I don't really like how fifth edition presents like AC. Like I know it's supposed to I'm, be more they're, they're trying simple. to make it simpler, but it somehow is less simple. I don't, I don't like it. Yeah. It just like armor sets your AC to a certain number. It doesn't add. And so I get that they want to prevent players from having to do too much addition, but in doing so they have just made it complicated in a different way. I don't know. Or maybe it, it, it makes sense to other people. It just, it seems very counterintuitive to me. Yeah. Yeah, it sucks. I've got one more uh, history question, Rob, and then I think we're going to wrap right. up our quiz. All right. Uh, so Let me see if I can get one of these correct. In in the in the first or original edition of Dungeons and Dragons, what modifiers were applied to characters who were women? <laughs> I actually have no idea. Um, I didn't even know that this was a thing. Uh, Matt, please tell me. This is exciting. So... It's uh, it's more complicated than I thought it was, Rob. But um, basically, uh, you know, back in sort of early editions, you didn't have ability modifiers for different races, but you did have ability score minimums and maximums. And for as listed in the game for female characters, for most races, they had a lower maximum for strength for female characters that ranged from three to one, except for half orcs, which female half orcs were allowed to have the same maximum strength. So, uh, um, and that's yeah. incredible information. Thank you, Matt, for sharing that with me and <laughs> with the readers uh, <laughs> or the listeners. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty, it sucks, right? <laughs> it sucks. It's bad. Um, yeah. Uh, first edition D and D is canceled folks. Um, I'll also point out that Dragon Magazine 3 had uh, a supplement article, Notes on Women and Magic. Uh, <laughs> great article <laughs> title. Um, um, very cool. We might cool. have to do a dramatic reading series on this, I, oh, I think. let's um, add it. Let's read Notes on Women and Magic. Yeah, uh, um, the full title of the article is Notes on Women in Magic, colon, Bringing the Distaff Gamer into D&D. But yes, uh, we'll, we'll women this. have lower strength scores, right? They were given 1d8 plus 1d6 instead of 3d6 in this article, not in the base rules. And a beauty stat between 2 and 20 <laughs> instead of charisma. Again, this oh, was just in this optional man. article, not the base rules. But regardless, it sucked ass. Oh, this is amazing. Yeah, we're going to come back to this. Uh, anyway, oh. all right, Rob, you, you've, you've failed slash succeeded at my quiz because the only winning move was not to play. <laughs> um, I hope that we've demonstrated that, uh, you, I don't know, God, I hope nobody ever like has quizzed any of you on like your D and D knowledge as a prerequisite to play or DM, but if they do, Tell them to fuck off and find somebody else to play with because it oh, doesn't. Oh, you like Dungeons and Dragons? Doesn't matter. Name five dragons. <laughs> I'll wait. Uh, Matt, thank you. I actually but also, don't think I can name five dragons, Rob. No, thank you. I don't think I can either. What? Ba Shit. Hamud? Tiamat? Those are gods. Those don't yeah, count. Th that's cheating. Uh, wait, hang Venom on. Fang. I remember Venom Fang from our Lost Mine of Fandelver episode. I feel like I was like accidentally named Skyrim Dragons. So yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know <laughs> if I can actually come up with five dragons and be sure that they're all D and D dragons. Can you name five Lord of the Rings dragons or Tolkien dragons? Are there five? There's there's okay. Uh, there's there's Smaug. Glaurung, There's Smaug. There's and Kagalong the Black. And Kagalong the Black, right? Um, are there any yep. others? That, that's probably it, actually. I think that those may be the only named dragons in... Please write us if you know another named dragon in the Tolkien mythos. I'm, I, I'm pretty that's sure those like are the... That's not like Tom we're, Bombadil we're, we're, from a we're Tom big, Bombadil We're big Lord ride. of the Rings hyper nerds, and I'm pretty sure those are the only named dragons. There were the which, cold drakes, right? No, the, there are other dragons, but they don't have names. Just a type of dragon. Yeah, right? there are definitely like other dragons running around. And the they werewolves of the last desert. But, uh, those but are Tolkien not dragons. doesn't give them specific individual names. There might Were be you one mad like in the Hobbit movie where the wereworms of the last desert showed up like fucking dune sandworms and Matt, made I holes will for the goblins be honest to come with out you, of? I did not see the last Hobbit movie because I was so disheartened by the first two. So if that is a thing that happened in uh, the last one, the Battle of the Five Armies, I didn't see it. So, um, yeah, 
Uh, I would have been mad, though, if I had seen that. I, I want to point out that Rob and I, despite being lore hyper nerds for all these things like Lord of the Rings and Star Wars, we're mad that The Hobbit, we didn't like The Hobbit movies because they were bad movies. They were not fun to watch. They, they were not entertaining or making us feel things. Pissed at the Lord of the Rings movies. In fact, I love them because they like left out Tom Bombadil or The Scouring of the Shire. Like they were great movies and I liked them. Uh, the Hobbit movies tried to include every fucking thing and ruined it, and they were bad. Yeah. They sucked. It's, we don't like bad movies. That's they a, that's a, sucked. They were real bad. Okay, speaking of, like, I think this is an appropriate letter for this episode. Speaking of uh, lore you shouldn't know, episode title, um, <laughs> here's a question about some deep pulls from Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, here's our letter. Um, Dear Matt and Rob, uh, I've been going through the Dragonlance audiobooks again, and I can't help but want to run this for my players. How would I best go about doing this? Is there a modern 5e campaign that I could tweak, or would it be better to create my own adventure campaign heavily inspired by Dragonlance? Thank you much, Jeremiah. Uh, this is interesting. I, I yeah, read all the What's dra- your feelings, Dragon? I read Dragon all the Dragonlance books as a as a young lad. Rob, not I my think f- we should revisit these uh, maybe for we the should. podcast. I gotta be honest, even then I was kind of like eh on them. I don't think they're bad. I just don't think they're very I don't know, but I like they feel kind of like sort of Shannara. They're just like very, very generic fantasy, and that's all well and good, but I just I I don't um not super enthused about any of them, but I read them all. And um, I mean, I think they're like maybe the the best of their era, like D oh, for sure. Yeah, spin off. That doesn't time, make them good, but they were uh, far superior it can make them to the very alternatives. Enjoyable. Yeah. And I know lots of people from uh, from our listener here to Jeremiah to uh, shit. What's that big beefy man who loves D and D? Joe Magli- Maglianello is like you know. Big oh, Dragon a big Dragonlance Lance fan. Yeah, I mean, lots of people really have warm feelings in their hearts. For riding dragons, dragons is pretty of, cool. Uh, you know, dragons of autumn twilight, dragons of summer ma- moons, dragons ma- many, of new moons, many dragons nerds breaking dawn. Have, have looked up to Rystalin Majir as a, um, I don't Tannis know, Tannis half elven, uh, some sort of Hasselhoff of, Burfoot. That's right. I got they're fine. They got good names. Yeah. They're vaguely an interesting adventuring party. Um sorry. Did I say Hasselhoff? Yeah, I think well, you said Hasselhoff. Tass- Tassel- but, uh, Tasselhoff. I, uh, Tasselhoff. Yeah. Tasselhoff. It's fine. Yeah. They're, they're fine. I don't know. Okay, I, would you uh, Yeah, they're fine. Um they I feel like going back to them. I don't know what I would expect. We should again, revisit for them because I I'm just like been, trying to remember like what nearly two decades since they're I read about them. um i mean riding dragons is cool having having lances being a dragon lancer that's neat that's a cool thing if, if i so to answer jeremiah's question right if i were would to run you this adapt a campaign based on it? i would not follow the books very closely and i say that because i don't remember what the books are about i would say feel free to draw upon the like the world and the lore and definitely lean into the whole dragons are common and people ride them and fight on them i don't know i make that like sort of a central part of the the campaign uh but without revisiting the books i couldn't i couldn't could not give you very useful advice on how to adapt that to build on rob's answers Not for 5th edition, or I think for 4th or 3rd, but for earlier editions, there are a ton, and all available on the DM's Guild, uh, setting books for Dragonlance, right? So, if you want uh, to set a campaign in the Dragonlance lore, it's basically one of your best supported campaign settings, right? Stats and stuff, you'll have to convert to 5th edition, again... We don't think that's too difficult. You could always find something from 5th edition that fits. But there is a ton, a ton of information about the Dragonlance world. There's even a Spelljammer book for Dragonlance. Crin Space. Um, <laughs> so, so if you want to build a campaign in the Dragonlance world, you have a ton of resources to support you. What about this question? Because I feel like lots... This is a more general question, Rob. We read a fantasy book. We like it. 
We want to run it for our players. Is that an instinct we should follow or what things should we think about as we do that? I mean, this happens to me a lot, but more it's what about this do I like? Because I more often when I am reading fantasy these days, the the it is immediately it immediately feels like this would not work as a campaign setting or a campaign by itself. However, there are these themes and ideas that I like, what I which I would like to steal from because novels have a existing character list and storyline um and usually the world is centered on those people and that story and so that makes it sort of difficult to directly use for a campaign setting but i do sometimes i I do often read things and get excited about how could i adapt this or how could i create something that is heavily inspired by this by this book I think I agree with that, Rob, and the Dragonlance campaigns are, you know, high fantasy, epic storytelling of the of the perfect ideal of that. And one of the problems with, I think, trying to run a campaign that follows those story beats is all the characters in Dragonlance make very, very specific decisions that are I would not expect player characters to often make. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, very much uh, and, based and on. I've, I've read about people running shadow critical role campaigns, right, and trying to follow the the path of the the critical role team. But that isn't that for the same reason doesn't work, right? Right. You, they don't make the same decisions. They, you know, you can't be expected. Your players can't be expected to have the same relationships and and go in the same places and do the same things. And so, it is challenging, I think, to sometimes adapt specific stories unless they have a very very rich world and a lot of i mean this was even hard this is even hard when you try to like i mean i I have tried to run or play in multiple lord Lord of the rings campaigns and that's hard because like at every point in the history somebody very important is doing something that matters and so you're always just a sideshow i don't know right if you wanted to, like, run the core story of Dragonlance about the the heroes who save the world and defeat the evil dragons, I think you could do that, right? Take the same overarching threat, right? Evil dragons, or I forget exactly what it was. And, Something and like that, then yeah. Build your own campaign based on what your players are interested in doing and their player characters, because maybe they're not going to make a tortured evil conflicted neutral mage or a what was it peace moon or something uh the first cleric in the world I, since I then i cannot right? remember yeah can't remember <laughs> right so you know your players are not going to have the same thing but it, you know if you want to say okay i'm going to read the Dragonlands campaign setting get the background this is the threat the player characters are going to tell a story to defeat that threat and then everything beyond that i think you would have to make from scratch i will say that because lots of people had this same feeling in the 80s and 90s, D&D made Dragonlance Classics Volume 1, 2, and 3, which is basically a, a set of adventure modules that follow the exact story of, I think, the original Dragonlance storyline. I do not recommend using them. They are poorly written, but they do exactly what you're asking. I don't think anyone would have fun playing them. I did not know that. Um, I didn't know people tried to do critical role shadow campaigns. That just sounds like a terrible idea. Same in the same vein as this. Yeah, I mean, I I think they were all shared as like this is was a nightmare game. But I do think some people have thought like this is this is what we should do. Let's just follow along. You know, l- let's recreate the story of critical role. Right. Uh, which it's it's good idea, bad idea, good idea. Use the Wildemont campaign setting or Exandra, right? And build your own story with similar things. Bad idea. Try and make your players do the exact same story as this novel or this other campaign. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, great question, Jeremiah. Yeah, let us know what you decide to do or how this pans out. Uh, There are a lot of neat things in Dragonlance. I remember liking the books very much, but I can't tell you anything about them now. I unfortunately of of all the fantasy series that I have read uh, and I did not retain much of that. So we might have to revisit that and revisit Dragonlance as a setting in a series and, and come back. Um, but it would be fun to maybe read one or part of one and, and see how it holds up. 
I think we could make it through one. Probably. I remember there was a knight with a sweet mustache. That sounds right. Mustache night. Okay, everyone. Well, <laughs> thank you for listening. Please leave us a rating or review. It helps the show. If you have a question for us, we'll get to your answers soon. Write us at dmofnon at gmail.com. Yes, absolutely. Stay healthy, stay safe, and keep rolling them dice.